Hey there, everybody. Great to see you this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Caleb and Becky and Jenna and Bella for leading us in worship this morning. That was awesome. It's great that we're able to gather in this crazy way during this crazy time um, so that we could be the family of God. So this is cool. Glad we can do this. I got a great uh, uh, Facebook message this morning. This is, let me show you, this is a view from uh, Blair Parrott's pew, he said. This is how he's watching <laughs> this morning. So I asked him if I could share this with everybody. I don't know if I'm encouraging bad behavior here. Last week it was Jackson Wright making pancakes, and this week it's Blair in the hot tub. But uh, church is happening in, in different ways these days. So uh, there we go. Well, this Sunday is the last part in the series of uh, beginnings in Genesis 1 through 11. We're actually going to look at just three verses in chapter 12. I keep saying it's Genesis 1 through 11 or Genesis 1 through 12. It's really Genesis 1 through 11. And these three verses that we're going to look at in chapter 12 are really the, the, the linchpin, the hinge, the, um, the connector of those first 11 chapters of Genesis with the whole rest of the Bible, and especially the Old Testament. Uh, the reason we've done this series is because I really wanted you guys to get a, a foundation for understanding uh, really the whole Bible and everything that the Bible is trying to teach us. And those first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are the key uh, foundational uh, chapters of the Bible. And like we said, we're looking at themes in there, and those themes run throughout the whole scripture. But ultimately, like we've said, this is a narrative that points to Jesus. And it's the themes in here are, are themes that have to do with our life. So here's where we've come so far. We saw that God created the heavens and the earth. He create, created the cosmos out of a chaos. And it was like a temple that he made that he was going to fill. And at the crown of his creation, after he orders it and he fills it with living things, he creates human beings, male and female in his image and he says to them go be fruitful multiply fill the earth and rule over it and the key things there that we talked about were image bearers people who represent him people who go forth in his name and they go they go and they fill and they continue this work of ordering and filling god's good creation and the image bearing is us representing god to one another and to the rest of creation. We, we reign with God and he walks with us. Unfortunately, as the story goes, humanity, instead of just walking with God and continuing his work of ordering and filling, we decide that uh, we're gonna reign in our own name. We're gonna rule in our own name. We are gonna take moral authority to ourselves. We decide that we're gonna decide what's right for us. And when we do that, we end up ruining relationships breaking our relationship with God and breaking our relationship with one another and breaking our relationship with the rest of creation. And so we see things start spinning out of control as Adam and Eve first between them, they break, they break from God, they break from each other, then Cain and Abel, and then it just spirals and spirals and spirals until you have the whole world filled with violence as the image of God is being defaced among one another. And so God brings the great flood to clean the world, to wash it clean, and out of that comes Noah and his family of eight. They begin to multiply. They're told as well, go be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And the people migrate to the plains of Shinar and they build Babel. And that's what we looked at last week, is Babel. Babel representing uh, the furthest that society gets from God. And, the, and, and Genesis starts with individuals, Adam and Eve. And at this point, at this low point in the story, it now has humanity as a mass, as a crowd. And they want to make a name for themselves. And Babel represents everything uh, that, that humanity does together. It's not just the individuals. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the people together. Together, uh, united against God in a one world system. And so here they are, and God then scatters them. We saw that the two main themes there were unity and technology. And God is okay with unity and technology. These are good things. But when you add sin to the mix, they become a bad thing. That when we put our heads together, together, our heads, we create really cool stuff. 
But when sin is there, everything that we make to push back the curse creates three more ways that we can make the world a worse place. And we're even seeing that today, to this day. And so here they are, and God scatters them. And that's going to set us up for what we're going to look at now, these three verses. But before we go there, I, I wanted to, to dwell a little longer on that, what happened there at Babel. Uh, because what happened at Babel, and the way that story is told is key for what we're looking at today as we wrap up our series. And what happens is this. So what you have in, in Genesis chapter 10 and 11 are the first speed bump in the Bible. You know, you get out your Bible and you're like, I'm going to read the Bible. You know, a lot of people say, I'm going to read the Bible. And they start reading it. And these stories in the beginning are kind of interesting and cool. And so you look at them and then you hit that, that, that part in the Bible that nobody likes and it's throughout the Bible. And that is a bunch of names, a genealogy. And so you hit the genealogy, and you're like, why are all these names in here? This is boring. Why am I reading this? Well, if you pay real close attention in the Bible, whenever it has these genealogies, you'll find lots of nuggets of gold in there. And this is no exception. This particular genealogy is what the Jews came to call, and we've called it ever since. It's called the Table of the Nations. Okay? And so let me show it to you. This, this chart is uh, for... Um, Josh Galander, he wanted me to put a chart up. So here's your chart, Josh. So this is the table of the nations. You'll notice at the top, so Noah has three sons, right? He has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And this genealogy flips the order around because it's gonna, the climax is Shem, the oldest son, but it starts with Japheth. And this, this genealogy is different than the other ones in the Bible because in this genealogy, uh, it's not just talking about this guy beget that guy and on and on and on. In this ge genealogy, they're talking about the people groups that came from Noah, the tribes, the nations, okay? So out of Japheth, you get 14 different nations, and they kind of move north of, of, of the Fertile Crescent. They open to Europe and into those areas. And then the second one is Ham, and Ham, out of Ham comes 30 nations, some of which comprise Canaan and then down into northern Africa. And then it gets to Shem. And out of Shem comes 26 nations. And Shem is where we get the word Shemite or Semite. So anybody who comes from Shem is a Semite. Now the interesting thing about this is that smack in the middle of this genealogy of Shem, they stick, the author sticks the story of the Tower of Babel. What a weird place to put this story. He sticks it right in the middle of this genealogy. And so you have the Tower of Babel story. And the interesting thing, too, is that the word Shem actually means name. Two things I want you to be thinking about throughout this message are the word name and nation. Name and nation. Two key words. So Shem means name. Yes, Noah named his firstborn son name. Real original. <laughs> he named him name. But remember from last week that in the story of the Tower of Babel, what were they doing? What was wrong with their unity and the technology that they put together? What was wrong with it was that they did it in their own name. They said they wanted to make their name, their Shem, great. And because of this, it just it le it leads to, to more sin, more oppression, and so God scatters them. And the only name they make for themselves is the name of that city. It's called Babel, which means confusion. And that becomes, as we said, Babylon, the representation of, of humanity united apart from God. So that's stuck in the middle of the story, or stuck in the middle of Shem's genealogy, is the story of the Tower of Babel. And then that story ends, and then it picks up Shem's genealogy, and it follows the line of Shem down to Abram. And that's what takes us to our main scripture today, the call of Abram. And at this point, his name is Abram. His name means exalted father at this point, and it's going to get changed. So let's... Uh, have a look at our scripture. Uh, let's see here. Our scripture this morning, we'll read it together. It said, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, so this is uh, this 
these three verses, and I can't uh, stress this enough, these three verses are three of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Like I said earlier, these are the hinge between Genesis 1 through 11, the rest of the Old Testament, and really the rest of the Bible. The Bible is a narrative, like we said, that points to Jesus. And more than Jesus, it points to God's plan in Jesus. Jesus, of course, is the main character. Uh, he is the hero of the story, we'll say, who brings all this together. But these three verses are the link. A lot of people read the Old Testament and they go, Why, what is this doing here? Because from Genesis 12 all the way to the end of the Old Testament, it seems only concerned about the Jews, about the people of Israel. What this, these three verses tell us is that it is concerned about more than the people of Israel. God has never stopped caring about the world. So it starts by saying, he says to Abram, go, just like he said to Adam and Eve, go. Just like he said to Noah, go, be fruitful, multiply. Just like he says to us later, go. There's that imperative, go. Go into all the world. And in this case, he says, go to the land that I'm going to show you. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. Go from your country, your people, your father's house to this land. This is crucial. This is key. Uh, what we want to see here next is that, let me, let me put this away for a second and show you a map of where he's being told to go to. So in this map, if you look up at the very top right, you see Ararat is being circled. So that's where Noah's Ark came in, it landed in those mountains. People migrated down into that green area called the Fertile Crescent. But they moved first to the next, that circled area, straight below Ararat, you see Babylon is circled, okay? So there's Babylon. Notice the compass, north, south, east, west. Notice to the direct west of Babylon is Canaan, or Israel, the Promised Land. Everything in the Bible is spoken of in reference to the Promised Land. So. Babylon represents the worst of the east. Remember that we said that east is bad in the Bible. The further east you go, the closer or the further away from the garden you get, the further away from God, the further away from God's design. And so Babel, Babel or Babylon represents uh, the worst of that. Look below Babylon and you'll see that little town called Ur. This is where Abram and his family are when God calls him. And he says, leave this place and go to the land that I'm going to show you. And he makes his way up and down, up and over. And he's the first character there in Genesis who turns and starts going the other way. He starts going west instead of going east. And this is key. This is the beginning of God's redemption plan. God's plan to redeem the world. And he starts by calling this guy and sending him west. He basically says, go west, old man. And this is the beginning of his plan. Well, the next thing he says to him is, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make your name great. And you will be a blessing. This should make you think about the Tower of Babel story. And our two words, nation and name, nation and name. So you have all the nations gathered together before they're split at Babel. And they want to make a name for themselves. And for that reason, God scatters them. And here you have Abraham being told, I am going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to make your name great. There's nothing wrong with having a great name. The problem is when we seek to make our own name great. That God is going to make Abraham's name great, and he's going to bless him. That's how he's going to do it. Our names are made great when God does the work, when God does the blessing. And the purpose of the blessing, the reason he's going to bless him, and this is key, and it's that last phrase where it says, all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. This is one of the most important phrases in the Bible. Helps you understand the whole Old Testament. That God is going to bless Abraham and his descendants, and the reason he's going to do it isn't just for Israel. The Old Testament isn't just about God picking a bunch of people and saying, you know, I give up on the rest of the world because I've tried it with the rest of the world and it's not working. So I'm just going to see if I can save at least this one nation. No, God's plan is that through Israel, he is going to redeem the whole world. And so that's what goes on for the remainder of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a record then of God's dealing with his chosen people 
But it isn't, he's not just concerned with his people. You can find in every book of the Old Testament pretty much a reference to the nations. I'm just going to give you a few as highlights. So, for example, in Genesis 49, the end of the book of Genesis, okay, Abraham has a son named uh, Isaac, who has a son named Jacob. Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes. His name gets changed to Israel. So, Israel has those 12 tribes, and of those 12 tribes then, he, he does a, a blessing to all his, his, uh, his sons. And in that, he speaks to Judah, and he says this. He says, Judah's a young lion. And he says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will obey. All nations. So here we've got this focus on Israel, and yet in, in Jacob's blessing of his son Judah, he says, this is a prophetic, um, this is a prophecy of the Messiah, saying he's going to come from the tribe of Judah, and that he's going to be a ruler, but he's not just going to be the ruler of Israel, he's going to be the ruler of all the nations. Fast forward, the 12 sons of Israel multiply, they move down to Egypt, they become enslaved by the Egyptians, they're down there for 400 years, God comes through Moses, sends Moses down there to rescue them, right? And, and in that rescue, again, you might think, well, this is just for him to choose his chosen people because he only cares about them. But listen to these words that God speaks to Pharaoh through Moses. He says this to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for this purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. The reason that God is rescuing Israel, and he's going to do it with these ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and all these, these things, is because he wants to show the world who he is, all the nations. Fast forward, they, they get into, into Israel, they have the period of the judges, then they start having kings, and under King Saul you have the story of David, and David and Goliath. Great story, lots of themes going on in there. You know, it's an underdog story. It's just got a lot of cool stuff going on. Well, when David goes out to actually meet Goliath, he goes to face him out there on the plain. Goliath taunts him, says, you know, what am I, a dog that you're going to come at me with sticks? He taunts David. David says back to him this, You come to me with sword and spear, but I come to you in the name of the, of the Lord God of Israel. There's the name. Again, he comes in God's name. Goliath comes with his modern technology. David comes in the name of the Lord. And he says this, This day the Lord's going to deliver you into my hands. He says, I'm going to cut your head off. We're going to defeat your armies. And this is going to happen. Why? So that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David is concerned about the reputation of God in the surrounding nations. He wants the nations to know that, that indeed there is a God in Israel. He's not just a tribal God, he's the God of all the earth. Fast forward to David's son, Solomon. Solomon builds the temple. He knows that God can't doesn't live in a house. He says that God will put his name there, his name there, his representation of who he is there in the temple. And he dedicates the temple and he says all these really cool things, but listen to this. At one point he says this, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, God, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and they pray towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built bears your name. So once again, Solomon is concerned that Israel would be a light to the nations, that people would come from far away in order to find God in Israel. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Unfortunately, Israel failed. When you read the Old Testament, you see failure after failure after failure, all kinds of unfaithfulness as they go. Because of their unfaithfulness, because they commit the same sins that Adam and Eve commit, that Cain commits, that the people of Noah's time commit, God brings the same judgment on them and he scatters them. 
He sends them into he sends the northern kingdom into exile into the nations, it says. The southern kingdom of Judah he sends into exile to none other than that place of all places in the east, Babylon. He sends them to Babylon. And there's this really sad, but at the same time hopeful passage in the prophet Ezekiel, where God says, I scattered you among the nations, Israel, and you profaned my name among the nations. He says, and because of my name, that I don't want my name to be profaned among the nations. I want the nations to know who I am. I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring you back to the land. And here's the hopeful part. He says, I'm going to bring you back. He goes, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you're going to be clean. And I'm going to put my spirit within you. And I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes and to do things the way I've always wanted you to do it. And I'm going to make a new covenant with you. It's a prophecy of the new covenant, of the coming of the Messiah. But he says, I'm going to bring you back in order to do that. And he does. He brings them back. He brings back the people from Babylon. They, they build a new temple. The nations are looking at them, but they aren't exactly drawn to God. Some people are, but not by and large. And then comes Jesus. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up to be the ultimate fulfillment of the blessing of Abraham. He begins his earthly ministry, and what does he do? He collects 12 disciples. 12, actually, they're called apostles, and then he sends them out. He sends them out into the villages of Israel, and he tells them to go in his name and preach that the kingdom has come, that God is breaking in to humanity, and he's going to bring his kingdom and his rule and his dominion the way it was supposed to be. And then a couple of chapters later, he gathers 70 disciples and he does the same thing and he sends them out to tell again in his name that the kingdom has come. And most people understand that the 12, the reason he picked the 12 was to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the reason he picked 70 was because of those 70 nations that we saw on that table of the nations. They added up to 70. 70 nations of the world that he's not just the Jewish Messiah, he's come to save the world. And so he does, and the way he does it, he finishes his earthly ministry, and unfortunately, in order for him to bring this blessing of Abraham, Israel has to fail one more time. It's their greatest failure, and in it, they reject their very own Messiah. They reject him, but it's through their rejection that salvation comes not just to Israel itself, but comes to the whole world. And so Jesus becomes the promise. He becomes the fulfillment of the blessing of Abraham. Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is the descendant of Shem. He's a son of Abraham, a son of Isaac, son of Jacob. He's a child of Israel. He's of the tribe of Judah and he's of the royal line of David. He is the fulfillment of the blessing of Abraham. And at the end of the Gospels, when he's risen from the dead, showing his victory over death and sin, right before his ascension, ascension, as we've talked about before, he gets those disciples together and he tells them one more time to go. And what does he say? He says, go and make disciples of who? Make disciples of all the nations. God wants to bring the nations back in. And we saw this last week at Pentecost, Babel begins to be reversed and the nations start to come in. And we see this uh, beautiful picture then at the end of the Bible in Revelation after God's followers have gone out into the world and preached the gospel to all nations. In Matthew 24, he says, and then the end will come. And in Revelation, we see a, a picture of the, of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. And John describes it this way. He says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. The nations are going to walk by its light. God doesn't have a problem with the nations. In fact, it says the glory and the honor of the nations are going to be brought into it all our ingenuity, all our creativity. God created us, remember, to be sub-creators. 
He created us to do things in his name and in his image, and that glory is going to be brought in to this new creation. And it goes on and says that, the, remember, the river of life is going to flow out of the temple, and the tree of life is on either side bearing 12 fruits. When you hear 12, you should think Israel. And the leaves of this tree of life are for the what? The healing of the nations. He's going to bring the nations back. And another vision in Revelation, and, and this is going to take us to our final theme that I want you to, to leave you with this morning. Uh, we see this. It's a beautiful picture. John says, After these things I looked, and behold, I saw a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. So not only this is a picture of the completion of the whole story, we've just kind of done the whole Bible in about 15 minutes, and in the completion of it we see people from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And this is our final theme. Right before this scene, uh, we, we have John... We, John's standing there and, he's, and he sees this heavenly vision and a question is asked, who is worthy to open the scroll? And what the scroll is is some of that strange stuff in Revelation. But he asks, who's worthy? And it says, nobody is found worthy. And John starts to weep because nobody's worthy. And then one of the 24 elders says to him, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, he is conquered and he is worthy. And John is all excited to see this conqueror, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, who's worthy. And he says he, and then he turns and he looks and he sees a lamb standing who is slain. He expects to see something powerful and mighty, but he sees a lamb who has been slain. We're going to sing in a minute a song that's, that takes from this. And that all of heaven sings, and every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And the final theme I want to leave you with before we sing this song is, is, is this. How God saved the world. When we look to see some sort of great conqueror, the lion of the tribe of Judah comes as a lamb. And to understand this, we go back and we look at Abraham. It starts with Abraham. That the beginning of God's redemption plan, he starts with an ordinary guy, an insignificant, ordinary guy, and his barren wife, Sarai, who can't have children. He changes this guy's name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude, because he's going to let his wife have one child, and from that child is going to come a nation, and out of that nation is going to come the Messiah. And in between Abraham and Jesus, and after Jesus, you have a big, long list of insignificant, weak, ordinary, out-of-the-way, lowly people. This is who God uses to accomplish His plan. This is how God himself came to accomplish his plan. Though Even though Jesus didn't sin, he was like all these other characters in every other way in the sense that he was lowly, he was ordinary. The Bible says he was nothing to look at. He came in weakness in order to save the world. And that is how he continues to carry out his plan. He carries out his plan through you and me. I don't know about you, but as I've been sitting in my house this week, unable to really go anywhere except out for a drive or a walk and have contact with people. For somebody who does what I do this is, and who is like me, an extrovert, it kind of drives you crazy. And it can make you feel pretty insignificant or pretty uh, useless or just like you really aren't getting much done. And even aside from this virus, I think a lot of us struggle with this. Even if this wasn't going on, many of us think of ourselves as, well, what are we really doing for the kingdom? And I just want to leave you with this thought. Don't think 
that you're supposed to do some huge gigantic thing that changes the whole world overnight. It's you in the ordinary. This is what God chooses to use to change the world is people like you and me who are ordinary. It's your loving of your wife or your husband or your brother or your sister or your children or your neighbor or your co-worker, even in this time. The small things you do, and if you look at the life of Abraham, it's very ordinary. A few strange things happen. He does have great moments of shining faith, but he has a lot of moments where he fails. And yet God uses it all. And he does the same with Moses, and he does the same with David, and he does the same with all the people, and all the way through, and Samson, and this one, and that one, and the disciples, and us. He wants to use you to change the world. And you may not see those changes in your lifetime, but they come about through your ordinariness, because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Remember that as we think of this big plan, this big picture, which is really amazing, and as we sing now, as we go to sing about worthy is the lamb who was slain, also remember that that same thing applies to you. He wants to use you uh, to carry out his plan and to change the world.